So, hello and a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from wherever you have joined us. Welcome to Biologically Speaking webinar series. Uh, we are an academic interest group, and as part of our science outreach activities, we organize regularly in a fortnightly manner uh, scientific webinar sessions and themed on specific topics. And for today, we have, our session is named as In Theory Session, where we will, we will get to know about the exciting insights about the theoretical, computational, mathematical principles underlying the cellular life and its functioning. Uh, I'm Dushan Kumar Shavastav. I'm, I'm from Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. I'm a PhD student, and I will be your host for today. So today, as, as I said to you today, our theory is named in the our session is named in theory. And I'm glad to share with you that we are joined by Professor Madan Rao, who is a senior professor at Simon Center for the Study of Living Machines at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, and Dr. Anand Srivastava who is assistant professor in the Molecular Biophysics Unit at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So we will start off uh, with our first speaker, uh, Professor Rao, who will give us uh, his insights on the theoretical framework which governs the cellular life across the scales. So before we begin, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Rao to all of you. Uh, professor Madan Rao is a theoretical physicist and a senior professor at Simon Center for the Study of Living Machines at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, Madan did his master's in physics from IIT Bombay and did his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, while working on hysteresis in model spin systems. And he then stayed back at ISC for doing his initial postdoctoral research. And then he moved to Simon Fraser University and did his further postdoctoral work under mentorship of Professor Michael Waters. Professor Rao began his career by joining Raman Research Institute as an associate professor. And, and then he was the founding member of the theory group, which is now known as the Simon Center for the Study of Living Machines, which is supported both by the National, uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences and also the Simons Foundation. He is also associated with the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, which is a constituent organization of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research as an associate faculty. Professor Rao at his lab in NCBS uncovers the physical and chemical principles which govern cellular functioning and hence its homeostasis across scales. He was the theoretical and math he uses the theoretical and mathematical approaches to answer the fundamental research questions in the field. His research interest involves active composite model of the cell surface, information transfer at the cell membrane, stochastic control mechanisms within eukaryotic cells, uh, active nuclear mechanics and chromatin organization, to name a few. Professor Rao has won many awards and accolades to his names, both nationally and internationally. And this includes the Distinguished, uh, Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Bombay, Swarna Jayanti Fellowship from Department of Science and Technology, the highly coveted Shanti Shuru Bhatnagar Award from Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. He got fellowships from Human Frontier Science Program and also CEFIPRA. He is an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, and he is also the current president of the biophysical, Indian Biophysical Society. So, Professor Rao, uh, thanks for being with us. It's great to have you with us today for the interview session. And with that, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks. So, so, should I just share my screen? Yeah, please. Yeah. And you can see it, I presume. No? You can see it and can you hear me? Yes, we can see it, Professor Rao. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks thanks a lot, uh, Dushyan, for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, and of course, the invitation to speak here. Um, it is a privilege to be able to share some of our work with young scientists across geographies and across time zones. Uh, while uh, today's session is uh, indeed about in theory, in quotes, uh, my talk is not going to be a theory heavy talk. Uh, it's going to be, so you won't see equations at all in my talk. Um, it is, but rather it's going to be a talk about theory energizing biology and uh, the fundamental issues and new perceptions uh, that arise when theory and experiment work together as it does of course in physics uh, in trying to think about cellular organization. So the key question that we are going to address today 
is what is the nature and patterning of the underlying forces that drive biological organization across scales. Um, the conceptual ideas that I'm going to present today come from a long standing collaboration, uh, a theory experimental collaboration with uh, Jitu Mayer's group at NCBS. And uh, it brings together much of a lot of modern ideas in physics and in cell biology. Uh, so to begin with, uh, what we're going to uh, uh, discuss is uh, molecular and functional organization at different scales in the cell. And as you see here, uh, of course, you, the familiar cartoon or schematic of the cell is shown here. And it's clear that the cell is a self-sustaining organized collection of chemicals, which is maintained out of equilibrium locally and persistently. This organization is at the scale of molecules, at the scale of assemblies of molecules, and the scales indeed of organelles within the cell, as you see here in these, in these uh, membrane bound organelles in the right. Now, this cellular organization is derived from two properties. One is inherited information from the mother, and the second is self organization, which requires non equilibrium self organization, in fact which requires a constant energy conversion flux. Okay? And typically the cell sort of burns out 10 to the seven ATP molecules per cell per second. You know? So it's a pretty substantial amount of energy input that goes into maintaining this organization. Now, indeed, in order to maintain this organization, you need to have forces and forces are the ones which maintain this organization. Okay. So indeed, one can ask, what is the nature of the forces that drive the spatiotemporal organization of cellular matter at these different scales that I talked about? The scale of molecules, assemblies of molecules, and organelles. What are the underlying forces? And the most natural framework uh, would be to formulate these organizing forces in terms of thermodynamic or equilibrium forces. Uh, that is, in terms of intermolecular, intermolecular interactions, uh, the standard ones such as van der Waals, uh, electrostatics, and so on, and more collective interactions such as polymer uh, and membrane entropic and elastic forces. Uh, however, there's another route to self-organization. Indeed, self-organization can also come about by non-equilibrium processes, not described by these intermolecular interactions and polymeric or membrane uh, elastic forces. Okay. Uh, and such a non uh, example of non equilibrium self organization is uh, demonstrated here by the many ways in which water turns into ice. Okay. The non equilibrium pathway obtained by a very fast quench or a temperature uh, lowering uh, under very special conditions gives rise to a rich diversity of ice flake forms that you see here. It is this non-equilibrium pathway that I would like to highlight in the context of the cell. In particular, I wish to draw your attention to the profound influence of non-equilibrium forces and their spatial temporal patterning in the establishment and control of cellular organization. That is to say, the organization of composition, structure, and form across different scales. In uh, recent years, uh, there has been a growing appreciation of the fundamental role played by non-equilibrium forces, which seem to pervade the bi biological world. Typical non-equilibrium situations in the living cell are associated with biochemical reaction cycles, such as shown here. An example is the phosphorylation dephosphorylation cycle, operating at the scale of a single molecule or molecular complexes. A typical cycle, uh, is characterized by an imbalance of, uh, of transition rates, shown here by the imbalance in the forward and backward arrows, okay. uh, and is maintained out of equilibrium by energy inputs, such as shown here. Okay. This combination drives the current through the loop, through this chemical loop, which results in the generation of internal non-equilibrium forces. Indeed, in order to maintain this, this uh, uh, this perpetual current, 
you need to drive the system out of equilibrium, which a cell does by maintaining the levels of ADP and ATP at some value. Okay? This generates a gradient in the chemical potential uh, of, a, of, of ATP, which is then responsible for the, uh, for the generation of this current, this non-equilibrium current. Okay. This non-equilibrium current, as I said, gives rise to forces, and the typical force uh, that is listed, um, uh, that is mentioned here is around 4 piconewton for a molecule such as myosin 2. This non-equilibrium current could even be used to drive information. Okay. And in fact, this information is associated with the free energy as is shown here. And in this sense, information is indeed physical and in principle measurable. Okay, now non-equilibrium forces uh, and, and fluxes have some unique phenotypic consequences, some of which are listed here, uh, some, such as uh, biomolecule synthesis, uh, e.g. the protein synthesis via ribosomes shown here, the fluxing of mass and charge through channels or pumps, uh, the mechanical movement which involves both shape changes and directed movement as shown here. What you see on the left is the, is the shape deformations of, of an entire tissue. And what you see here in these beautiful moving images is uh, keratocytes, which, uh, which spontaneously move okay, under the influence of these non-equilibrium forces. Um, they also, of course, uh, lead to clustering and recruitment of, of uh, molecules and chemicals. Uh, and this is, you, you see this in, in pictures such as uh, where, my, where this arrow is pointing. And in, in uh, actomyosin complexes, which are uh, produced in vivo, okay, which shows a clustering and coming together of molecules driven by these actomyosin complexes. Uh, at uh, large scales, uh, the positioning, centering, and organization of cellular organelles are also determined by non-equilibrium force patterning, okay? primarily uh, from active cytoskeletal elements, which are molecular agencies of biological force and act both as force generators and as force sensors. Examples here are, of course, the familiar actin and myosin complexes and forces due to actin polymerization, depolymerization, microtubule motor complexes, and again, forces coming from microtubule polymerization, depolymerization. What you see here is the uh, thing, this is the Golgi and the ER, which, whose stability and fluctuations and form is maintained by active forces coming from uh, actin myosin and microtubules. What you see here on the right is the centering and the positioning of the nucleus in mammalian cells, which is driven primarily by actomyosin contactile forces. This is work from Shiv Shankar's lab, with which, with whom we have collaborated in a theoretical project. Uh, on the on the bottom left here is uh, the nucleus centering in yeast in uh, yeast cells, which are centered not by actomyosin as in mammalian cells but by microtubule polymerization depolymerization forces. This work is done by a postdoc of mine, Ashutosh Jain, in uh, collaboration with his colleagues at, uh, at the Institute Curie. Uh, and uh, what you see here is, uh, is a cellular realizations of this active force patterning. This is a beautiful set of experiments done recently from Manuel Theory's lab. And you see how actin, and microtubules form these beautiful patterns, okay, uh, which is responsible for the centering of centrosomes within uh, mammalian cells. Right. So, with this in mind, uh, uh, you know what you saw so far is the large-scale centering, positioning of organelles, the the form and stability of organelles. But now I'd like to turn to a, uh, uh, to a rather subtle and non-obvious example of organization, which is again driven by non-equilibrium forces, force pattern. And that is the organization of molecules on the cell membrane. The cell membrane being the multi-component asymmetric bilayer of lipids and proteins that in envelops the cell and forms the skin around, 
around the cell. Okay. These, the claim of this of my of, of the talk and indeed which comes from uh, decades of work uh, from uh, from our lab and others shows that actomyosin contractility, whose cycle is shown in the left, gives rise to nano and mesoscale organization of lipids and proteins on the cell membrane. This is indeed not obvious, not surprising. It's pretty surprising. And it is the result of intense experiments done at different scales and theoretical analysis and a theoretical framework built to, to drive the experimental proof. So what we are going to see uh, is that the non-equilibrium organization of the cell surface, which was, as I said, associated with the non-equilibrium biochemical cycle, cycle of this type, is going to be responsible for the lateral organization of the present proteins. Okay. Um, now, typically, the lateral organization of uh, lipids and proteins uh, has been explained via equilibrium models of organization. Okay. Uh, and this is what I, this slide is going to try to uh, describe very briefly, of course. Uh, now, uh, these equilibrium models of, of, uh, of membrane organization are typically mul uh, deal with multi-component lipids. And a typical multi-component lipid equilibrium phase diagram is shown in these triangular phase diagrams, the tetrahedral phase diagrams here. Okay. Uh, these are phase diagrams for artificial membranes having three or more components. And uh, this, indeed, these set of artificial membrane experiments have, have driven a lot of the thinking uh, uh, in, uh, of these equilibrium models. Um, so the mixed phase, which is observed at high, high enough temperatures, uh, is uh, is where these multi-component lipids form a homogeneous mixed regime, and that indeed is the uh, is the uh, message uh, or is envisaged by the so-called fluid mosaic model, which is one of the first models uh, by Singer and Nicholson to establish indeed that the the existence of a membrane enveloping the cell. Subsequently, uh, in, uh, much later in 1997, this gave right, uh, there came about another uh, uh, idea, namely that the cell membrane was actually built, uh, actually construct, constructed not in this uh, homogeneous mixed regime, but at but is actually built from these phase segregated uh, uh, lipids. That is, the multi-component lipids separate into phase segregated regions. And as these phase segregated regions that exist at the cell membrane. Okay, so this this became the uh, uh, the prototypical models for the so-called Daft hypothesis. Okay, so uh, so both these models are of course uh, they are they are posited on equilibrium thermodynamics. Okay, uh, however, uh, these these uh, uh, these these um, Lip, for instance, GPMVs, namely giant plasma membrane uh, uh, vesicles, which have been extracted from the cell membrane, uh, showed this kind of segregation, this kind of liquid order, liquid disorder segregation, only at low temperatures, lower than 25 degrees as shown here. Okay. And of course, cannot explain the organization of molecules at uh, physiological temperatures, which is 37 degrees. Okay. In all these models, the protein organization follows the lipid organization. The proteins are supposed to be enriched in specific lipid domains, and this could be viewed as a top-down approach. Okay. Now, as I said, however, such equilibrium lipid models, uh, segregation models, uh, though attractive, uh, faced a problem because these kind of uh, segregation regimes could not be seen in the cell. Moreover, in artificial membranes, they could only be seen at low temperatures much lower than the physiological temperature. Now, over the years, we have been uh, taking a more bottom-up approach rather than the top-down approach that I talked about earlier. And uh, this viewpoint brings in two uh, radically new ingredients. The first ingredient is a new molecular agency that couples to a variety of cell membrane molecules. And this is going to be uh, 
actin and myosin. It also brings in the, uh, the existence or the, the involvement of a new kind of force, non-equilibrium forces rather than equilibrium forces that I talked about earlier. And these also arise from actin and myosin, which, which adjoins and is juxtaposed immediately beneath the plasma membrane. Uh, the, the models that I'm going to talk uh, talking about are, uh, are based on non-equilibrium physics rather than the equilibrium physics models that I talked about earlier. Okay. Now, theoretical analysis of the of experimental homofret, which is a, a technique, a spectroscopic technique to measure proximity between molecules. Theoretical analysis of such uh, homofret studies on the organization of both GPI anchor proteins shown here, which sit at the upper leaflet of the plasma membrane, and transmembrane proteins which straddle uh, across the width of the plasma membrane. Both these kinds of molecules uh, reveal the existence of very tiny nanoclusters, okay? as shown on the left. These nanoclusters uh, are, are, as I said, uh, built are tiny. They are built from maximally four to five molecules of GPI anchor proteins or transmembrane proteins, and they are very dynamic. Okay? They, in fact, uh, break up and or fragment into monomers and reform into fragments at a very fast rate, okay. uh, uh, around uh, a tenth of a second uh, from, from the measurements that we have done. Uh, and indeed, the, the fragmentation and the reformation of these uh, nanoclusters is dependent on actomyosin contractility and dependent on cholesterol. The moment you perturb actomyosin contractility, or perturb the levels of cholesterol, you find that these nanoclusters break up into and form and form these monomers. When you, once you restore actomyosin contractility and restore the levels of cholesterol on the cell, then you find that they reform into these nanoclusters. Okay, so the dynamic nanoclusters that are that are that are seen that are observed at the cell surface of both these GP anchored lipid tether proteins which rest on the upper leaflet of the plasma membrane and transmembrane proteins. And these both of these are contingent on non-equilibrium forces arising from actomyosin contractility. So these observations and more provide the motivation for the model of a cell surface as an active composite, okay? wherein, such as what I'm drawing here, wherein a contractile dynamic active actomyosin layer is juxtaposed tightly with the plasma multi-component plasma membrane shown here. Okay. Is the active stresses from this uh, actomyosin uh, meshwork that, that applies, that, that drives molecular organization on the juxtaposed cell membrane. Okay. So this is what I say here. The active stresses from actomyosin drive contractile flows in the cell membrane leading to transient nanoclusters. This theoretical framework uh, is reported, has been, was reported a long while back in Kripa Gauri Shankar's paper here in cell. Okay, now this uh, actomyosin clustering was found, as I said, for both GP anchor proteins and transmembrane proteins. Okay, GP anchor pro those kind of GP anchor proteins that had, uh, had the capacity to bind to act. Um, and the key ingredients of this of this uh, uh, of this nanocluster formation was the was found to be the following: you need to have myosin motors which generate contractile stresses. You need to have small dynamic actin filaments nucleated by a, uh, an actin nucleator called formin. You need to have a lipid bilayer which has components which are capable of interacting with actin. For in the case of GP anchored proteins, you need an abundance of cholesterol. And you need to have turnover of these actomyosin components. Okay. These key ingredients sufficed to create nanoclusters of, of uh, a large class of molecules which are capable of, of uh, binding to actin. Okay. And uh, this movie that I'm showing you here is a result of uh, simulations uh, and, and theoretical work. Oops. Yeah, and, and, and what you see here is a sort of a pictorial representation of uh, what the theory tells you, namely that actomyosin drives cytoplasmic flows, which then in turn drives the clustering of molecules at the cell surface. 
But you see, this was beautifully recapitulated by in vitro experiments done by a postdoc, um, Dariush Koster, who is now a faculty member at Warwick, uh, which shows actin and myosin bringing together membrane proteins into tight uh, clusters on on the on the on uh, supported by them. Now, uh, so so far we talked about nanoclusters that are that are formed and how nanoclusters are formed. For the formation of nanoclusters is being contingent on the non-equilibrium forces coming from actin and myosin. Uh, but looking beyond from the nano range to a larger scale, okay, again, a bottom-up approach, we found that these nanoclusters actually form and cluster together. They form the basic motives for a larger mesoscale organization. This is beautifully seen in these fret maps captured here. You blow up this little square here and look at the homofret patterning of, uh, of these GP anchor proteins. And by doing a binary, uh, binary uh, thresholding, you find that these red regions here are enriched in nanoclusters of GP anchor proteins. And indeed, this kind of the, the scale of this is, um, is, uh, uh, is, is a micron scale. And you see that the nanoclusters indeed form the motives for a larger mesoscale organization. Okay. Um, again, this mesoscale organization is contingent on actomyosin contractility and on the participation of cholesterol. You remove these two agencies, uh, you remove, you destroy the formation of both the nanoscale organization of GP anchor proteins and the mesoscale organization. Okay. So this is what I uh, is the bottom line of this of the slide, namely the mesoscale organization is contingent on actomyosin contractor stresses and an abundance of cholesterol. So now, uh, while transmembrane proteins, uh, which are ca capable of binding to actin, could easily be imagined to you know directly bind in the cytoplasmic uh, tail region to actin, how do the GP anchor proteins bind to actin? Because the GP anchor proteins are upper, upper leaflet proteins, and the tail of the GP anchor protein only reaches halfway down to the to the uh, through the uh, through the membrane. Okay, how do they enter? And clearly, there must be other players around. Them. And indeed, what we found, and this is reported in uh, in this paper, uh, using again a FRET analysis and molecular dynamics uh, detailed atomistic molecular dynamics simulations, uh, was that the GP anchor proteins indeed require other players in order to connect to actin. It requires a trans bilayer bridge, which involves sphingolipids, cholesterol, and phosphate and uh, PS, phosphatidyl serine, which is a charged lipid sitting in the inner leaflet of the plasma plane. So it's this bridge from the outer leaflet, uh, uh, outer leaflet GP anchor protein to the inner leaflet phosphatidylserine that then connects to the actin actomyosin below and drives the nanocluster. Okay. And indeed, what we find is that it drives the, also the mesoscale cluster. Okay. So, uh, so from this, you know, this gives rise to uh, a, a theoretical framework that uh, that we have very recently developed, and uh, it's uh, present in it's first demonstrated in this in this paper. Uh, where we go from how to go from the nano to the mesoscale organization. Do these nanoscale motives come together to form larger domains? And if so, what are the uh, physical characteristics of this? Using both kinetic Monte Carlo simulations and an active version of Flory Huggins kind of theory, we describe the segregation of a multi component membrane driven by these active contractile stresses. And what they show is that these nanoscale. Uh, Organizations indeed give rise to mesoscale uh, organizations. The the, uh, the segregation does not extend and, and encompass uh, the you know the uh, uh, does not form macroscopic domains as you would see in normal phase segregation. But in these gets saturated at these mesoscale. Uh, the other amazing consequence is that one sees. Uh, unlike an equilibrium segregation where you cannot see, you only see phase segregation below TC. In this active segregation, uh, uh, you see phase segregation or you see segregation even at temperatures above the putative equilibrium transition temperature. Okay. And this is because 
the instability of the homogeneous phase is driven not by gradients in chemical potential, but by active stresses themselves, which are present even for temperatures above the 23 degree putative uh, equilibrium phase transition temperature. So this indeed provides an explanation why indeed you see uh, mesoscale uh, domains at temperatures, at physiological temperatures. Uh, what you also see is that the domains uh, from these kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, you find that these domains undergo macroscopic uh, fluctuations, uh, fluctuations at the scale of the mesoscale of the of the mesoscale domains. This is again rare to find in equilibrium uh, phase segregation context. Very big domains will not break up into tiny domains because it costs too much energy to do so. Uh, whereas here, because the fluctuations of these domains are driven by fluctuating active stresses. Uh, you can indeed uh, break up and reform these mesoscale domains. So one of the predictions that comes up from these uh, this theoretical analysis is that you would see a you would see uh, domain formation and segregation even above TC. These domains are mesoscale domains, and these mesoscale domains are highly fluctuating. So uh, what I've described so far is that the cell membrane organization of lipids and proteins at physiological temperatures, that is the temperatures above the equilibrium phase segregation temperature, is contingent on the following fundamentally new ingredients. It's contingent on actomyosin stresses coming from the actin and, and myosin cortical layer just beneath the plasma membrane. It, it comes from a coupling of PS, phosphatidyl serine, to, uh, to the actin and myosin uh, complex. It comes from trans bilayer coupling of the PS with LO components and GP angle proteins and cholesterol sitting on the upper leaflet and lateral LO interactions. And these together, namely the combination of uh, active forces and uh, equilibrium forces, namely trans bilayer coupling and lateral LO interactions gives rise to what we call an active emulsion, even at temperatures above the putative uh, equilibrium transition temperature. Okay. So this we believe is a new paradigm for uh, molecular organization, uh, a paradigm which might go beyond uh, just the 2D membrane uh, uh, organization, but also might reveal itself in 3D organizations in the cytoplasm. Uh, now, such uh, so what I drawn here is our uh, picture about how, and indeed at the moment in this paper uh, we are show, we show experimental evidence for this uh, for this kind of organization, where we where the organization is driven, as I said, by a combination of trans bilayer coupling, contractile stresses, which bring these nanoscale motifs to form this mesoscale organization. Now, this is a bottom-up organization, very different from the top-down organization that I talked about uh, earlier. And this bottom-up organization has lessons to say about specificity, about how does organization of different kinds of molecules happen on the cell surface. And this is where, uh, this is what la is launching our next phase of the program. Uh, what we are finding is that the actomyosin, uh, that in order to uh, meet the demands of specificity of, uh, of clustering on the cell membrane. Uh, what we find is that there is a fine structure of the actomyosin cortex. It's not just a homogeneous uh, uh, layer of actin and myosin, but indeed it has a diversity of local force generators and their force spatial patterning in terms of different species of myosin, namely myosin 1 and myosin 2. It also involves the diversity of actin nucleators, namely formin and up to three. It involves a stratified organization of these uh, force generators and force sensors. And it involves differential actin binding affinity of membrane proteins. And these uh, set of, 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 uh, of properties together uh, is what we hope give rise to specificity in molecular clustering non-equilibrium molecular clustering at, at the cell surface. So I've argued now that the cell surface is an active uh, composite, um, an active composite which is built of a, of a asymmetric bilayer juxtaposed with an active, active uh, actomycin contractile layer. 
And that is the patterning of active force generators that shape the patterning of cell membrane molecules. So this is what I meant about active force patterning or non-equilibrium force patterning. Um, and indeed, what we find, the, there must be a feedback from the cell membrane molecules to the active force generators themselves in the cortex, giving rise to an interesting uh, you know, feedback which involves what we call active molecules, such as T cell receptors and integrant receptors, which I'm not going to address today. Um, so, so this indeed gives rise to a very rich, rich picture. Uh, and our current understanding is that the cell surface is more than a multi-component asymmetric bilayer at equilibrium, but rather an active composite subject to spatiotemporal regulated non-equilibrium stresses. It is in perpetual ferment because of this non-equilibrium driving, uh, and it is pregnant and open and, uh, and susceptible to possibilities. Um, to me, this picture has a sense of uh, inevitability. It has a sense, it's a very compelling picture, which uh, uh, because it has in it uh, the idea of local control of molecular composition on the cell membrane. And it continues to drive our, uh, our uh, research. Um, so, uh, so just to conclude, our current understanding is that the cell surface is more than a multi-component asymmetric bilayer, uh, but rather as an active membrane composite that has shown here and is subject to spatiotemporally regulated non-equilibrium stresses. It is, as I said, in perpetual ferment. Um, and with this, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, and I hope I've been able to convey the profound influence of non-equilibrium forces, in addition, of course, to the usual equilibrium forces, uh, which drive cellular organization across scales. Ultimately, even the higher level cellular processes involved in information processing, computation and control, this is what is driving my own research agenda now, uh, have to be understood in terms of these non-equilibrium forces and, and their patterning. And for this, we need to develop new conceptual theoretical descriptions and new experimental strategies for their measurement. Uh, so uh, I now have the pleasure of uh, acknowledging and thanking the many talented students, postdocs and collaborators, both theorists and experimentalists, uh, who have been fellow travelers in this very long journey, uh, and a journey that continues uh, to reveal new directions of inquiry. Uh, a lot of this work, I mean, all of this work indeed, uh, has been done in very, very close collaboration with my friend and colleague, uh, Satyajit Mayer. Uh, and uh, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, working with him. Um, uh, and I also would like to thank my extremely uh, bright and uh, effervescent uh, colleagues at the Simon Center. Uh, it's a very vibrant, intellectually vibrant place, uh, and it's full of ideas and uh, and, uh, and and discussion. Unfortunately, the, the current pandemic has prevented a lot of that happening, but we'll, we're slowly coming back. Um, uh, and I thank you very, very much. Uh, the funding, uh, just to, uh, before I end the talk, I just would like to mention that the funding comes from, of course, NCBS, which is part of TIFR. Uh, it also comes from a very generous support by uh, the Simons Foundation in the US. And uh, uh, I'm also funded uh, by the Department of uh, Science and Technology India through uh, GC Boost Fellowship. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rao, for the exhilarating talk. And those were really some wonderful insights in, in the field. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. So uh, in the interest of time, we can take a, uh, some of them to you. Is it okay sure. to read them out yeah. for you? Okay, yeah, sure. so what should I do? Should I just... Uh, yeah, you can stop sharing the screen. Stop sharing, and yeah. Stop. yeah. Yeah, fine. So the first question is uh, from Shonchari Gorai. She has two-part question. She is asking, I want to ask, uh, is there any way to change the non-equilibrium forces to the equilibrium forces is the first question. And the second one is, can we simulate the rate of these forces using those tools in case of cancer cells in vitro? So I'll take the first question. The, the first question, yes, you, indeed, you can stop... Uh, uh, actomycin contractility by putting in the cell uh, by putting drugs such as blebiscatin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are lots of there are lots of cocktail of drugs that you can put, which stops the activity of these uh, myosin motors. 
and thereby uh, you can stop the non-equilibrium first uh, generation in this particular context. Uh, and the second question was what? Uh, second question was, uh, can we simulate the rate of these forces using those tools in case of cancer cells in vitro? Uh, I guess I, 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 uh, I mean, okay. Uh, I don't want to, uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not, I will not be able to answer that question because uh, I, I'm certainly not an expert on cancer cells. And so I, I shouldn't say something uh, wrong. So I'm not going to say it. <laughs> So uh, Krishnamurti wants to know, can this, non, can this non equilibrium forces be generalized to try and explain the other architectural organizations within the cell? Yes, indeed. And there's been a lot of work done by us and other and many other uh, colleagues all over the world, uh, where they uh, where they look at organal shapes and uh, their positioning. Uh, 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 then uh, the movement of, of cells, etc., which is all driven by actin and myosin. Uh, chromatin organization is a very hot field these days, and there's a lot of work showing that non-equilibrium forces uh, are responsible for uh, the organization of uh, and positioning of, of gene loci and so on. So there's, there's a lot of work on, on this field. Yeah, but going and, and indeed in this on the, at the scale of the tissue, uh, there's a phenomenal work. Uh, which shows how actomyosin, amongst other uh, non-equilibrium agencies, uh, drive the changes in geometry, in topology, and in flows, uh, and indeed in cell fate in uh, in uh, different tissue contexts and developmental contexts. So I hope that answers the question, and we can take one more, and then we will move on to the next session. Uh, from Sanat Kumar, can you derive the size of the domains through a force balance argument? Yes, uh, that, that's in, in fact, so, uh, okay, the size of the nanoclusters uh, are indeed uh, derived from these, uh, from the force balance uh, that you that you mentioned. This force balance uh, is, of course, as you, as you could realize, it's a, it's a combination of non-equilibrium forces and, uh, and equilibrium, but mainly driven by non-equilibrium forces. Uh, the larger scale, mesoscale organization is more subtle. And uh, I haven't yet uh, uh, figured out how to how to arrive at that large scale uh, uh, that, that that large length scale because it's it's, it's contingent on many many uh, effects such as uh, the uh, the area fraction of the lipids that are involved. Remember, the large scale organization, the meso scale organization, is not only set by active stresses, but also by the sea of uh, LO lipids that are, uh, that are uh, uh, in, in this active, active emulsion. So, uh, so that's a more complicated uh, 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 calculation. And uh, we, need to, we need to understand that in, a bit, in greater detail. So Professor, thank you for answering the questions and thank you for the wonderful talk. So I think uh, uh, we can uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Aran Shivaspa. So all the participants, see if we have any further questions to, to Professor Rao, we will have an interactive session after uh, Dr. Aran's talk. So you can ask them directly to him uh, during the interactive session. So our next speaker in, for in theory session is uh, Dr. Anand Shivaspa. Uh, so Dr. Anand Shivaspa is an assistant professor at uh, Molecular Biophysics Unit in the Indian Institute of Science, which is situated in Bangalore. And Dr. Anand, thanks for, thanks for being with us. It's great to have you. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anand to all of you. Anand did, did his BTEC from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, where he majored in ocean engineering and naval architecture. During his undergraduate days, he learned and got trained in how to make oil rigs, ships, visiting docks, and shipyards and doing plate mechanics with finite element methods. Then he went on to pursue his PhD from the Ohio State University uh, in, in the field of mechanical engineering. Uh, and he did his PhD uh, by bagging a very prestigious fellowship from the National Science Foundation. In his doctoral research, he worked on the glass transition of polymer thin films using MD simulations. He did his postdoctoral work with Professor Gregory Watt at the University of Chicago in the Department of Chemistry 
and he worked on statistical mechanics based coarse grained uh, method development and membrane biophysics problem he started his own group in 2015 in the molecular biophysics unit at iisc and anand's lab develops and uses multi scale theories molecular simulations and applies concepts from statistical mechanics and condensed matter physics to understand the behavior of complex biophysical systems his group is doing excellent work in the field which are very well documented as publications in journals of international reputation he has he has mentored many postdoctoral fellows and phd students in his lab and also enthusiastically guided several undergraduate and postgraduate trainees in his lab and many exciting science is coming out from his lab uh, in the recent times and i myself i'm a follower of his work so dr anand it's great to have you with that over to you uh, thanks dushyant for a very a uh, very kind uh, introduction uh, so without much ado and uh, and thanks for organizing this uh, wonderful event over the year months and years and also trying to inspire and uh, ignite young minds across the country it's very nice and i wish you guys luck in uh, doing this further as you go ahead so uh, and and thanks madan for giving a very nice wonderful talk as as always quite a learning experience um so i'm going to talk about i uh, just let me try to make sure that my screen is visible is my screen visible to all yes it's fine um, you can um, move go ahead so uh, so i am going to talk about uh, molecular simulation as a structural refinement uh, tool and essentially focus more on the molecular biophysics of uh, protein and protein dynamics and it will be a talk quite different than what madan has given my my framework will be a equilibrium framework and there are many things you can still understand in the equilibrium framework and i'll try to uh, put forward some of those ideas um and uh, so i have tried given what i spoke with dushyant i've tried to keep a part of the discussion very pedagogical and so i'll start with some of the history uh, historical aspects in uh, in how theory and you know uh, experiments have worked in 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 close collaboration to give us uh, more insights into the world that we live in so the first example so and i i am i am i am sold out on the molecular hypothesis or the atomic hypothesis so i'll start with a a quote from um richard feynman who says that if essentially the whole point is that if if the whole uh, world is to be destroyed and one information has to be passed on then he says that i i believe it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made up of atoms and uh, little particles move around in perpetual motion attracting each other when they are little distance apart and repelling upon uh, being squeezed into one another and that is one sentence that you would like contains any known information and and could be passed on to the posterity for um, and and from there you can build upon uh, and and th there is a there is a reason why i think uh, someone like feynman would say this because it's not very obvious that so what we consider obvious now as an atomic world you know is not something that was obvious uh, all the way 200 150 years back and I, i'll give you an example and 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 show you an uh, essentially a uh, just a minute my this i'll remove this and show you an example uh, and and try to from that example essentially uh, present that point of view so uh, how so this this dawn of molecular reality what we are calling is actually something that is only around 150 200 years back and and it and it started with a question that robert brown uh, it started with an experiment a simple experiment by robert brown So Robert Brown was a botanist in uh, I think British Museum and and he he was trying to find out how fertilization happens uh, via pollination in flowers. This is very special flowers that he has named after Lewis and of the Lewis and Clark fame. I'm I'm not going to the history of I'm a quite a history buff in 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 biology. So um and and what he observed is that the pollen grains were moving in the in the fluid that he had subjected and 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 the hypothesis that he was pursuing is that there is a driving force you know there is an energy uh, uh, active energy in the system that is because the pollen is a living being or has and and then he tried out with uh, different uh, particles 
and all the particles actually were showing the similar motion. I mean, he, he was so possessed with it that he even tried uh, uh, woods or leaves that were dead for years. And, and at that time, uh, I mean, dust particles from the snicks that has just come from Egypt. He, he took it from the nose and put it and tried to see. So, so, so what in the end was the deduction is that no matter what, if the particle is of the right size and in, in the, it, it has what is now called Brownian motion. And 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 the and and so the question then was then what is the origin of this? Why does the particle have a Brownian motion? And 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 so uh, Robert Brown pursued it, and in in few years he gave it up and and moved on. And but but there were scientists who were talking about this, and it took almost eighty years for someone like like of the stature of Albert Einstein, who who actually put forward a very nice thorough theory. Um, on the, and the, the, this paper was published in 1905, which says on the movement of movement of small particles suspended in stationary liquid required. And at, at that time, molecular kinetic theory of heat and, you know, uh, people like Gibbs and uh, Boltzmann and all were coming up and, and trying to put forward the statistical uh, theory, statistical mechanics theory of uh, material and, and matter. And, and so Einstein, so Einstein did two things which any theorist should aim for. This is what one is he tried to explain what was observed and he, he argued that this particle is in a, so it moves and you would think that there's a force, effective force on the particle, but we know that this is an equilibrium system. So like what Madan was saying, there has to be some force that is making it jiggle and wiggle. And actually that is happening because there's a locally, transiently, there's an imbalance of forces because this particle is jostling around with others. And, and that leads to the motion of this particle. And, and so that is how we, and so essentially the point was that there are other particles which are actually hitting it and there's stochastic collisions and so on and so forth. The other thing which any theorist should aim for is to provide testable hypothesis. And this is exactly what he did in his equation, the diffusion equation that he derived. That led to Perrine who, uh, who was already working on this problem uh, to actually set up uh, experiments which uh, which concretely proved like he, he basically could measure the Avogadro, he could count the uh, number of atoms in a mole and this was the and 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 Perrin actually experimentally validated this and and this actually this whole framework of theory experiment and modeling uh, not theory and experiment working uh, in a cyclic manner uh, led to this atomistic world hypothesis that we take for so granted right now. I and mean, if you ask a kid in high school, uh, they would say that there is an atom that exists. So, though it's not a very obvious uh, uh, knowledge, uh, right? And and so, so the statistical description description of atomic behavior provided testable hypothesis for experimentalists to count atom with ordinary microscope. That was what uh, Einstein did. Provided a testable hypothesis. And the other thing was, and this is something that I find very fascinating. So Wilhelm Oswald, who is known for his work on catalysis and is one of the pioneers of modern, you know, physical chemistry and the foremost opponent of atomic hypothesis became an avid believer because Einstein's complete explanation of Brownian motion. So it took a theorist to uh, convince uh, somebody like Oswald that atoms existed. And, and so my point being that since the uh, today's forum is on, uh, on in theory in biology, is that there is a place uh, if you do uh, theory in a proper manner where you take into account experimental inputs as, as you saw in the previous talk and, and then propose uh, why that works and testable hypothesis. That is where I think uh, the contribution of theory comes, uh, can be appreciated most and, and contribute most to the science that we are doing. Now, uh, this brings me uh, so, so what happened because of this is it opened up the whole uh, whole area of exploring things from the molecular point of view, the uh, explanation of entropy coming into play from a more statistical point of view. Entropy was there in the times of uh, where you are thinking more from the you know Carnot cycles and heat engine cycles, but now you had these ideas of uh, uh, molecular picture of the world where uh, statistical thermodynamics took uh, took center stage and and I, I put this slide too because it serves two purposes for me one is to ask a few questions that may not be very 
answer to which may not be very obvious to many people who are uh, not uh, thinking about it. And the other is because it helps me explain some of the concepts that comes down the line in my talk. So uh, if you take a, 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 a box and put it in with half of it with ideal gas, and ideal gases are ones which do not interact with each other, at least when they are uh, at sparsely populated. And, and then you take off the, uh, the boundary that you create, the gas particle starts expanding, right? And, and, and eventually it will expand and take up the whole, whole volume. And the question that I like to pose to students this is one of my favorite questions is, is why do the gas expands, right? So they do not expand because they're repelling or attracting each other, like what, uh, what Feynman was saying. Uh, so they are actually there because of uh, entropy, like there are, there, there, are, there are probabilities of existence and, and they exist with the highest, the, there are more number of occurrence. So this, this, the whole point is that besides interactions that are taking place between the particles, there's also the, there's another molecular driving force which is entropy. That is one thing that I would like to take, take it away from here. And, and so a free energy comes into play where you have both the contribution of uh, interactions and entropy, come, uh, which is driving the whole processes, at least what is visible at the molecular level. And the second concept which I wanted to introduce and which led to a lot of things in the future, like uh, with, based on random walk idea, is the concept of detail balance. So if you draw a line on this, like I've done in the middle uh, segment here and ask the question like, so, you know, this, so this is the equilibrium system, the, uh, but then there is a dynamic equilibrium here, right? There are particles that are going away from, uh, on one side of this boundary and coming any boundary that any fictitious plane that you draw. And, and, and this is where you, you can think of something called micro reversibility or, or uh, detail balance where the flux uh, and the product of the population and the, and the rate of exchange at that boundary is actually maintained because of uh, this whole uh, dynamic equilibrium uh, framework or interactions that are there. Now this can, this, it is not, so in this particular example, you have equal number of particles passing through the boundary, but, but that need uh, and coming and going out that maintains this dynamic equilibrium. But that need not be the case. And I am repeat, I'm talking about this example from, because it, it helps me explain some of the, uh, the multiple conformation uh, influx flow of uh, proteins that happens later in the talk. And so if you actually create a gradient, let's say with, with some sort of uh, external, so suppose you create a temperature gradient, then the detail balance would be maintained in the box, but then it would, it would actually honor the, the boundary conditions that you have. And so the probabilities uh, or the uh, will of exchange from one side to the other, the, the flux will not be the same, but, but overall the detail balance will be. So, so it's central to a uh, random walk, equilibrium kind of uh, at the molecular level. This is, this would be the takeaway from, from this slide. Now, uh, uh, so the other thing, so now I have not talked about biology here. And so the other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, before I moved on to the research that I'm going to talk is how is it relevant in biology, right? And, and so, so being, so I have a more structural biology, structural biology uh, viewpoint. And so I'll start with something that uh, has fascinated humankind forever, but that is the, the principles of genetics. Like how, how do I look similar to my father and, and, and how do you carry information forward uh, in a living organism, right? And this is just goes beyond looks it's like many aspects of uh, genetic, uh, of uh, generational like genetics. Uh, and, and so one of the first uh, uh, clear evidence that, uh, you know, there is there's something called transforming principle that was followed by Oswald Avery way back in the uh, uh, mid, uh, around early 19, 1900s. And, uh, and, and, and so, so nucleic acid was now established as the transforming principle, but, but you didn't know how it worked, right? And, and so following, there was some more work where it was found that there are four different kinds of nucleotide and they always paired with each other. And, they, and, 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 and these were all purely biochemistry or cell biological inferences. Now it's still not it's still not clear how actually is the information passed from one generation to another when a cell is dividing and how does the uh, 
the the when the cell divides and how is that information carried in the other cell and and when the and so taking the and this is where the structure the when the structure of nucleic acid was uh, found or modeled it became very apparent just by looking at the structure you could actually say how the you know how the uh, information could be templated to the next generation and this this so there are two points that I would like to make here. One is, of course, the, uh, the, the structure gave you the information about the function and also a, a approach where multiple information from experiments came into play and, and then, so for example, there's this Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction data uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Watson and Creek used uh, without her permission, I believe. And, uh, and, and, and then there was this uh, data from uh, Chargaff rule and many other information at the time that were put together to develop this model. And, 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 and it is one of the best example in my opinion, where you can clearly see how form actually informs the function. And, and the double D, D, uh, it, it was very clear that this double standard DNA could produce exact copy of itself and carry genetic instruction. And, but it also had a very profound influence on the molecular biology field, the way we think about protein folding and functions and so on. And that is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so for those of you, I, I'm pretty sure this is a biology audience, so most of you would know uh, central dogma and how from the DNA transcription to the uh, translation and, and you have this polypeptide chain that uh, gets formed and eventually this polypeptide chain uh, forms these uh, peptide bonds, the amino acids form peptide bonds, and, and these peptide bonds actually will fold into, see this, this polypeptide will fold into a certain uh, form, and the form will determine the function of this. Uh, at this point, I would just take a break and inform that this, uh, so our department, Molecular Biophysics Unit, is celebrating the 50 years of its establishment by uh, G.N. Ramachanan, who was one of the people who has worked a lot on the peptide bonds and, and shown that there are certain allowable regions of the uh, rotation angles of these bonds and, and so uh, had made seminal contribution in, in this, uh, uh, this field. So, so going back to the uh, talk, uh, so you have these uh, polypeptide chains and, and given the sequence, generally for the last, before uh, it, it's assumed that it will fold into a certain uh, form and that form will define the function. And, 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 and for the simple uh, argument, you can say that it's like, there's a sequence that folds in a fork, there's a sequence that folds to a spoon. And so fork does one job and so you have one sequence for that and fork and knife does another job and you have another sequence for that. And so this, this is very, very clear when you actually, this is some data from uh, folding simulations from my group, where you take uh, trip cage and beta hairpin uh, uh, sequences, very different sequences. And you can clearly see how differently they fold. It's not like all sequences are folding. And so the fundamental question here is that, you know, the fold is actually there to have a function. Like you need a spoon to do something. You need a knife to do something. How is that information coded in the, in the genes, right? And how does it know where to, uh, how, how does the folding happen? And, and so this is a big question. And for, uh, for simpler protein, you can probably a peptide, you can actually develop a, a model and show this, but it, it's even more difficult for larger, but it became more and more clear that, um, that given the sequence, you could actually have a fold and the fold can actually tell you that if once you have these structural, very fine level structural information, you actually know a lot about the, 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 the way things were working at molecular level. And hemoglobin is another example of this. This is one of the first, uh, one of the early, I would say, uh, larger structures uh, solved by Max Perutz after 30 years, almost 30 years of working on it. Imagine if you take a problem and work for 30 years in your lab. I mean, I, I don't think um, you would be welcome for that long. Uh, and so, so, and, and so the, the whole point that I'm trying to make is that there's a polypeptide chain uh, that, that was thought that that is what the uh, understanding was that would fold into a certain uh, form and that form will define the function. And this is true for GPCRs, all different kinds of proteins that you can think of. Now, um, but it is also true like uh, that the way I was talking about detail balance that 
there may be a single fold and then there are other conformations of it and there are they are in dynamic equilibrium with each other just like the detail balance that i was talking about and 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 because the fold is at the basin of the energy like it is the most minimum energy and other other conformations have energy that are much higher the effective probability of these final folds are so high that the others become um, sort of immaterial or functionally not important and this is what it, you can think of as understanding that is that is there in the folded protein regime now there is another class of protein which i i will be talking about and that is called uh, id this is popularly this is called idps intrinsically disordered protein that do not have a free energy basin that is a funnel shape but has a more shallow free energy basin and the shallow free energy basin what happens is that because you have a there is a the dynamic equilibrium between the conformations are uh, more dominant there are more exchanges happening and and because of those exchanges they do not exist in one single big population but multiple conformations can exist in um, in you know in in equivalent population so this more like a de degenerate structures that are available and so uh, and so there's a advantage to this right so the advantage is that here in the first one for the every function you wanted to express a certain sequence and that would fold into a a form and then you do the job with it you uh, cut with the knife you eat with a spoon and but you need another sequence for that but with this idp the advantage is that it's like a swiss knife that is the most common example people give where one sequence depending on what kind of function you would like or what kind of environment it is in um actually you can take different forms and you can have a so that that is one big implication the other implication which i'm not going to talk about is the way these uh, multivalent uh, interactions leads to what are now called membraneless organelles another fascinating uh, so these are organelles in the cells that do not have uh, lipid as the boundaries and they exist and very very fascinating another aspects implication of idps multivalency degeneracy so i am going to focus more on the single molecule uh, conformational landscape and and so but functionally it has a variety but then it becomes very difficult to study and this is where theory and molecular simulations have i think are contributing a lot more than usual than you would see them contribute in 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 uh, standard biophysical uh, problems so so you know this is one example that i have which is from my simulation where you have all these different conformations and and the experiments are actually an ensembled average and 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 so you don't get because there is no one fold you don't get a single experimental so the, the experimental data is an average ensembled average data and so it becomes very difficult to actually tease out molecular level information uh, for example here i am showing a statin file i'll come back to this and and i was thinking how i can present this to the uh, to the audience and think about it this way so all of you know what is a newton disk so when you take the newton disk and actually rotate it at a very high speed you actually get a white uh, image in front of you right and but we you know you know that there are many different colors so experiment so in idp you can you get experimental signatures that are white because it's an averaged Uh, they are dynamically changing proteins conformations with different populations of conformation but actually you want this information right you want like you want to know how each conformations how much populated they are like they have different colors in the in the newton disk and so you need a machine or you need a method that can actually take this white data that you have and give you correct populations and conformations of this and this is what we have been doing for the last few years uh, using statistical mechanics based methods and and trying to get all the conformations that are possible for these idps and so this work was uh, we uh, so all the details if you are interested in the details we have published this work and all the codes it's available uh, in literature and i'm happy to talk about it i'm i'm focusing more on the broader picture in this this year so I, i'll skip this in interest of time but the whole idea is that we have used this whole idea of random walk uh, in in temperature space and in hamiltonian space to actually extract out the conformations and and this is some advanced version of what is called replica exchange in the field and and so what this has led us is that it has given us signatures so 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 what so for example this is histatin 5 which is a, a antimicrobial peptide and and this is 
uh, it's highly charged and it is very small in hydrophobicity. So, so you can imagine it, it is highly degenerate structure. It, it has a very disordered. And if, if you actually look at the experimental data, the, the, this is the SACS profile. So like I said, you cannot have one structure from let's say X-ray or NMR or um, any other experiment. So there are multiple structures that are giving you an average data. This is the average SACS profile. And, and so our method actually is able to capture the uh, SACS profile uh, uh, matches with, and th th this basically tantamounts to saying that the sampling data must be correct, right? So, so the, the population, so we are able to capture the populations properly. And here you can see, this is very interesting uh, from the point of view that you have a sequence, but it doesn't fold in one single, like I've, so this is the sequence uh, of the this IDP. Now, um, and, and we matched with NMR data, chemical shift data and other things. And, 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 and this seems to work very nicely. So we, so uh, Dushant, how much time do I have? And you can go on, yeah. I think okay. you have 10 more minutes. No okay, so maybe I can finish one, uh, one story. So one of the, so then the question became like, what do you, uh, like the IDPs are not just 20 amino acids, 10 amino acids long, which generally simulation or uh, theoretical work would assume. Some of them are actually more than 100 amino acid long. And I'm giving you one example from a protein called HNRNPA1, which has become lately a, a, a sort of a paradigm a protein, like model protein to study these, uh, both uh, single molecule conformational landscape and also uh, phase separation, liquid liquid phase separation. This protein is interested from the point of view of uh, telomere maintenance. And uh, so you have these, uh, so the end of the DNA is actually, uh, you have uh, a, a set of sequences that, that folds into uh, quadruplexes. And you, as you can see here in, in D loops and T loops. And, and so, they cannot be replicated because of the structure that they have. So every cell cycle replication, uh, you lose a part of this quadruplex, the G quadruplex structure. And, and after a few cycles, uh, you lose all of it and, and the cell goes into senescence. So you, the cell dies. So there are few cycles that are normal cells would go through and die because, uh, because the end of the DNA uh, end, end protection problem um, it's, it's by design actually, but then in certain cells like stem cell and in uh, and, and by design and and in in cancer cells because of the pathological uh, uh, mutations or other things, this mechanism actually is not there. And in that case, the uh, the the end of the DNA actually the telomere is actually uh, gets repeated. Uh, the, that 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 stretch of sequences. And, and the, pro the protein that I'm talking about is one of the proteins that actually mediates this whole process with, with uh, uh, some DNA, uh, some other RNA and other, other enzymes and proteins in the system. So there's a whole uh, set of proteins and uh, uh, RNAs that are mediating these processes, but uh, fair to say that uh, we are focused on what is the conformation of this uh, long, more than 100 amino acid sequence that would actually give you the, uh, that is actually doing this uh, uh, role of unraveling the uh, the capped end of the uh, telomere and and helping it in the replication cycle so that there is a permanent the, the cell is not dying every every uh, replication cycle it is continuing and so this is a long sequence more than 100 amino acid long and it has a rgg rich sequence and a, pro, a, a prion like domain sequence and i'll quickly go through and, and there's some experiments that have been done, NMR experiments, uh, without knowing the structures because of the reasons I told you, uh, has been uh, done from uh, Mahavir Singh's lab in MBU and also from Tanya Mehtaj's lab uh, in the United States. So, uh, so what we did, so Tanya Mehtaj's lab actually published in 2020 the whole chemical shift data of, uh, of the IDP sequence of, uh, of the HNRNP1. We took that data and subjected it to our analysis. So, so we had we actually generated the set of confirmation using the method that I described of, and we saw that the the matching was very uh, 
it was pretty good actually with the with the chemical shift data which led us to believe that we may be actually getting the right conformations or populations of conformation so this is for the prion like domain this is for the uh, rgg domain and you can see the red one is the predicted data and the uh, from our models and the and the blue one is the experimental data uh, from the chemical shift like amide chemical shift c a C alpha chemicals, if carbonyl chemicals. So I would say this, these are excellent matches, uh, uh, which essentially says that the set of ensemble conformation and that we are getting is actually replicating the experiments, which essentially tells uh, which. So, so because we are doing molecular simulations at atomic resolutions, you are actually able to get all the conformations. And then we do this uh, population analysis and we are able to extract out different clusters of this long uh, uh, sequences and 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 average of it is what you saw in the uh, chemical shift data that so this is what we have been do, uh, doing and and the next step that we are currently pursuing which is underway is how does this these different sequences structures that you have of the same protein in different population four to five percent population uh, are there particular residues that bind to the uh, to the different uh, structural motifs of the RNA, or are there certain uh, specific binding, or is there a, a binding geometry? So we are looking into that. That will shed light into how, uh, what are the molecular level mechanisms that are actually letting the uh, telomere, uh, the the way the this protein actually perturbs the end end of the telomere and helps in the replication cycle. So may may give some window into that and. And hopefully, uh, and and the and and so this the uh, this is the integrative approach that we are taking, where we are now treating these conformations as you can think of as uh, target molecules and the substrate as the RNA, and and then looking at the conformations, binding conformations, and and if we are able to match the experimental data. So I don't have much time left, but I will. Uh, uh, we have also extended the same framework of integrative modeling to look at other proteins. For example, this is a HIV GAG protein where you have, it's a multi-domain protein with long linker regions. And because of that, you don't get a single, for, so you have individual domains which are actually spliced and, and could be solved, structure, uh, structures are solved. But when you have them combined together, you are not able to get the conformations of the, uh, of the whole multi-domain protein what you have the experimental SACS or SANS profile, which intensity. And so our modeling using a genetic algorithm based approach, which is a different method than uh, the replica exchange that I talked about, we are actually able to um, combine molecular simulation and, and put these constraints in the, uh, the experimental constraint and use a genetic algorithm based uh, optimization technique to uh, get the, ex the simulation conform conformations that eventually yields you the experimental SACS intensity, uh, SANS intensity. And through that, we are able to get a bunch of confirmations that um, this is the match that you see, the maroon versus the experimental data. And, and so it gives you a set of confirmation at very high resolution. And, and, and you can actually then look at the problems which I did not discuss uh, with this confirmation. So I'll take just five more minutes and finish with one another example that is currently going on in the lab. And that is a, a protein which actually is uh, called a beta protein. It comes from uh, amyloid beta precursor protein, which is an integral membrane protein in neural synapses. And it's very important uh, for regulation of neural plasticity and, and, and other functions. And so interesting thing is that when there's a, some a cleavage happens and you have these, uh, so there, when the, there's a peptide that comes out and if the cleavage is normal, then normal functions continues. But if you have a, a, a peptide sequence that is uh, longer than, a little longer than what is uh, generally done, then these peptides actually start aggregating and eventually form these fibrils, long fibrils. And these fibrils actually are the reasons why are, are, are one of the major components of Alzheimer diseases. And, and so there's a lot of work going on to actually stop this process of formation of oligomers and protofibrils and, and eventually fibrils that are formed. And so one of the drug, which is a repurposed drug that is being used is, uh, I'll call it G5. And this one actually is, uh, 
able to, you can see these are experimental data coming from last year's work from, um, from the group of, I, uh, from Heller and all. And here you, you, you have, you can see like, so you can think of this as, uh, as a fibril's mass, how much it is changing. And when you subject this to the drug, small drug molecule, you can see like uh, it is really drastically reduced. And so the question is, how is this happening? And so they, they did in vivo studies also to, uh, to show this. And, and so when they looked at the binding affinities, it was very, very weak. I mean, you can see that this is the ITC experimental data, uh, isothermal uh, calorimetry. And here you can see that it, 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 it shows that the enthalpic interaction is pretty weak. And they hypothesized that actually the, uh, there is a, uh, the interactions are more entropic in nature. And so generous, I, we asked them, we, we thought that we had a better way of looking at these proteins. So we asked for the whole conformation that they had. They were generous enough to give us that. And then, then we ran, so there's some non-linear di non dimensionally reduction techniques that we have developed in the lab that actually can take these very, very disparate structures. And, and even if they have a two or three percent populations of each of these structures, we are able to cluster them properly. And, and so we get these vast clusters of e equivalent uh, conformers together and so we we are able to do this and you can see like this is the structure with the uh, without the drug molecule and here the green ones in this are the ones with the with the drug molecule so so sorry the purple ones this brown one are the uh, g5 molecule and so now we have a set of data that has proteins with the uh, without the uh, drug molecule and with the drug molecule and and what the method that we have is the uniqueness that we have brought in is that we have this conformation that are nicely clustered, even though it's like all over the place. If you so you can see here that they have a whole region of what they call as highly entropic system. But our method is actually also able to develop subclusters out of this, and and so we are hoping that this gives us more insights into um, how the binding happens. If if there are uh, if it's a weak binding, then what? Are there specific residues that are mediating those, or it is all over the place? So this this is expected to give us insight into that and and further shed light on the uh, on the whole process of how it inhibits the formation of fibrils. And so I'll end here by saying that um, that right now uh, we are at the the molecular dynamic simulations and also molecular simulations in general, particularly in biophysical uh, literature field, is at the place where simulations and experiment are complementary because of the scales that experiments are also reaching like they're reaching in the time scales uh, of the nano and and microseconds and also in the uh, spatial resolution is is coming more and more down and so with this uh, you can combine together the biomolecular simulations if done properly with thermodynamics and kinetics in place with the experimental data and and shed more light onto what is happening at the molecular level and uh, an integrative modeling is one of the ways to do it, where you take information from multiple experimental sources and, and combine them using this uh, approach uh, with uh, molecular simulations as your, uh, as your uh, integrator and, and, and get deeper insight into this. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for patiently listening to the talk and um, uh, allowing me the extra time to speak. Uh, so most of the work has been done by Dr. Rajeshwari Appadurai, who has a Welcome Trust Fellowship of her own and has been doing some brilliant work in the lab. And uh, uh, Iravati has done some work on the HNR and PA1 protein. And Krishnakant's work, which I couldn't show, has worked on the uh, on the genetic algorithm. So I just showed the uh, the HIV system, but he has also worked on other proteins where you just have SACS or SANS data and you'd like to have a higher resolution structure. So he has been working on that. So with that, I would like to thank all of you and, and take up questions and, uh, and pass it on to Dushyant. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anand, for the wonderful presentation. It was excellent and it was, and the historical background that you gave were very much interesting. And it was like reliving the notion of Richard Feynman through his lives. So it was a great talk. And we have a couple of questions in the chat box. So if you uh, if you permit me, then I can read them out for you. Yes, please, go ahead. Sure. So first question is from Rupatha. Uh, 
Is it possible to capture the, capture the various conformations adopted by a protein in its folding pathway by experimental methods applicable at the relevant time scale? Yeah, that's actually, uh, it's one of the reasons why you would like to use uh, this approach that we are doing is that it is, it's much, much more difficult. For example, you could take, uh, you could do a FRET and actually tag different parts of the protein and, and then monitor like whether they are coming close and not, and then, but you still get an ensemble average data out of it. So it, it's much difficult to uh, do this, particularly if you have like, like what I we saw was four or five percent of different conformations. So, so the averaging is so much that uh, you lose out that information. So yeah, it's it's a difficult one. But but yeah, people have been trying. Um, I mean, one of the methods that is catching up is is cryo EM uh, microscopy, where you actually all the different things that you have time frozen, like at one free, and so you you can actually then take each one of them and look at how. And so that probably gives you some windows into how. Um, those uh, more higher resolution conformations. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. And next question is from uh, uh, Krishnamurti. Uh, speaking from a general perspective, a crystal or cryon structure is more likely to represent the structure which is energetically most stable or the predominant state in solution. Can we reliably combine molecular simulations with structure visualization techniques to get a holistic understanding of functionally important structural features, which also includes a uh, uh, possible, uh, which possibly involves intermediate or transient transit states. Yeah, this has been going on in the field. I mean, it's uh, so uh, before the before the IDPs took center stage. I mean, the folded proteins. Uh, there were models which were uh, which you could use, like elastic network model and other models, to look at uh, different conformations and also look at binding and partner binding partners. So yeah, surely you can use molecular simulations to combine all this and, and get this, yes. So I hope Krishna had his answer. Uh, next question is from Zixin Ho. Uh, uh, hello, thank you for a nice talk, for your nice talk. I want to ask a question. Uh, how to tell whether this is LLPS or gel-like structure for the IDPs? If you uh, study I... the dynamics of, sorry. Uh, can, can I read it up? Read it yes, up? Go, ahead, go ahead. Okay, sorry. If we study the dynamics of the molecules inside the droplet, then how would we know? How would we know if the time in simulation is comparable to the time in reality? Yeah, so I have not spoken about. Uh, uh, so I said that the IDPs, when you think about it, has two different implications that are very clear right now. One is at the molecular recognition level, where you have these uh, different conformations that may be binding to different partners or different uh, uh, in different ways. And that is what I focused on. The other is, of course, the, they, they, they tend to form LLPS, but not all of them. And so I don't know exactly how to answer this question. But uh, I mean, there are experiments, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, FRAP and others, which people have been using. But I'm, I'm not sure, like, what, whether we, they can reach the resolution that you are talking about, uh, uh, Zin Zin. Sorry about that. And then next question is from Vikram, the last one. If we move from all atom, all atom to coarse grain, is it possible sample? Uh, is it possible to sample more confirmation of protein? <laughs> no, <laughs> you don't. I mean, that's the whole idea. So, uh, so what happens? So, for example, you can actually get. I mean, we have been doing that too. Like, it's more difficult to start from all atom and then look for. So uh, you can, for example, the work that Krishnakant did with the HIV mole gag molecule, actually we start with a coarse grain model and, and then we, so it's more like a polymer. So you are asking like, what is the radius of gyration distribution of my polymer? And once you have that, then, then we are doing what is called a molecular refinement. So because our coarse grain resolution is at one, uh, one site per, uh, uh, per amino acid, so we are able to back map it and do some local minimization for every conformation and get this. So you can do that and people have been doing it lately because it's faster, but, uh, but there are uh, aspects that you may not be, be able to capture. Like for example, uh, there may be rotamers when you are placing your uh, higher resolution models then uh, because it's a low resolution, there may be other rotamers that may fit in the same um, same conformation of coarse grain. So, so yeah, so there is always a trade-off between 
accuracy and fastness in this. So I think with that, we come to the end of the question and answer session. There are some more questions. I think we should open it for the interaction. And then, so the participants, if you want to directly interact with the speakers, please raise your hand. Uh, we will unmute you. And then you can directly ask your questions to the speaker. And I will start off by asking the first question myself. I will take the opportunity for being the moderator. Being the moderator. So my question is to uh, Professor Lau. Uh, like we know we have a long standing, very much successful standard model, which explains the various aspects of the various physical forces. Uh, and many of the things in the universe be, are being explained by the standard model. Uh, so uh, I just want to ask you, do we have, or we, we can expect, do we, can we expect to have a unified theoretical framework uh, or a model which can explain uh, functioning of the cell or the biological systems per se at different scales in a very unified manner? No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I was thinking if, if, we, if something like a standard model we can get in, in, in our... Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I don't, uh, I mean, what you're asking is more of a philosophical question, but uh, biological systems are, are, uh, are characterized by complexity, diversity, and uh, uh, no one in the, no one uh, who's practicing scientist would ever uh, yeah. dream of uh, trying to fit a unified theory of biology or uh, i mean I, I mean we know that for example mem plasma membrane has more than 800 different types of lipid i mean how do you unify that like the lipid yeah. obvious data so that, that... Yeah, so that was uh, sort of a very possible dream kind of thing so, <laughs> so no, but maybe you don't want that so is I mean, there shouldn't be a, uh, I, I think uh, you know even in um, uh, so you you know you give the example of a standard model, which is a which is a model in particle physics and high energy physics and so on. But if you go to low energy scales such as uh, condensed matter physics, yes. there is no unified uh, theory for condensed matter absolute, phenomena. Absolute. So yeah, so uh, one shouldn't uh, you know what what uh, I mean? I'm essentially a soft matter non equilibrium uh, condensed matter person, uh, and uh, there we we talk about uh, you know about uh, effective theories which are valid in their particular domain of validity you know their energy scales and their, their deformation scales etc and you don't go beyond that and and we so we talk of uh, effective theories and that's the kind of uh, uh, i think that's a, a richer para uh, paradigm and you know one of the persons who's written very eloquently about this is uh, is uh, philip anderson uh, who passed away unfortunately uh, last year, and was it last year or this year? I don't know. And uh, he uh, he's written this very uh, lovely set of essays called uh, "More Is Different." Yeah. So, so highly recommended. Uh, so I, read. Sure, I will. I will, I will read that. I will look for that. So, uh, Krishna Muthi have a question. Like, uh, thank you for the wonderful talks and your answers, Professor Rao and Dr. Shrivastav. I have a general question. To my knowledge, there is a lack of teaching of theoretical sciences in the college level and a general perception that these works are very complex. As a scientific community, how important is it to change these perceptions and how do you think we should go about it? So I missed the first part. Uh, first, whom we are addressing this to? This is, uh, this is a general question to both of you. Oh. Uh, what was the question? This is by Krishnamurti. Yeah, is it? so is, uh, yeah, he wants to know. Uh, yeah, to, my, can... to, to my knowledge, uh, there is a lack of teaching of theoretical sciences in the college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can read it. Yeah, sure. So uh, yes, this is this is an absolutely pressing concern of uh, uh, of scientists in India. I mean, I think uh, and Sanat can uh, can uh, contribute here, but in the US is of course much much better. Uh, there are uh, uh, people such as uh, Phil Nelson and others, and uh, uh, who um, have who have uh, tried to uh, uh, you know influence undergraduate teaching and and modernize undergraduate thinking to bring in quantitative aspects 
uh, which are absolutely important now because the experiments are getting so precise, so fine, so uh, high resolution that you cannot um, uh, you cannot uh, do experiments without having a quantitative background. And the lack of uh, a traditional lack of uh, quantitative uh, training uh, is actually harmful and 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 would uh, would would limit the progress in biological sciences. Uh, people, I mean, the scientific community in the U.S. has has been aware of the fact. For I mean, all of us have been aware of the fact, but they have done something about it. Uh, we in India have have unfortunately not bothered about undergraduate teaching, and uh, and I, I I say this by looking at students who come to NCBS for PhD, who come in for the PhD, and they have absolutely no training at all in quant the quantitative. Uh, aspects or in physics and uh, uh, and uh, this is this should change how it is to be changed is is uh, a very deep problem given the complexities of the education system in india but uh, uh, but this is certainly uh, what you saying is important and, uh, yes. and sanat might be able to say something in the us side dr anand you want to contribute something for anyone else me yeah i I don't know. I mean, Madan has been in this for longer than me. I, I, I face the same things and particularly being in biology where you are doing, uh, where the students, you, you have to, there is, a, there is a sort of a steep hill that they have to climb before they are able to get to the stage where, you, you know, you can talk to them about, let's say, statistical mechanics or, or just original ideas. Um, and I think it is it is surely missing, I, I believe. And, and something needs to be done. And that is why when we started this discussion before others were coming in, I thought like we have to actually start it from the, not just undergrad level. It has to start from a much, much earlier level where you uh, you catch them when they're there in the high school, I, I would think, or may, maybe middle. So you have to start doing, we have to start going to schools now and high schools and middle schools and start giving. And now like how, what, uh, like how payments are like, if you can't explain it to like commonly in a common language, then I think we probably don't understand it that way too. So I think that will be a challenge for us also. For example, when I was asked to give this talk, I thought like, how will I explain ensemble average? And then I thought of Newton's disc and maybe that was an example I thought I really liked. I, I thought that passed on the message well. So we, we will have to innovate also as yeah. teachers and, and then kind of make uh, sort of make a well-planned way in which you would like to approach it. There are people who are actually doing this, uh, some people, but but I think they need to be pushed forward and more needs to come. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, Sanan, your take? Sure. Um, so I have a lot of things I can think about here, right? So if you look at what's happening today, uh, if you go back and look at our high schools, uh, the kids learn very little math. So my kid was an honors math student. She learned three weeks of trigonometry. All right. It's, you know, how do you learn trigonometry in three weeks, right? So obviously she got turned off math and she's now an English literature major. So we're losing a very strong care of our students because of the way we teach. A second thing that happens when kids come to undergraduate and graduate school is that they have things like lamps available to them. So they never write an MD code, you know, so they don't feel any reason to write it because lamps exist, right? The third thing I've noticed now is everybody wants to do machine learning. Again, that's a piece of code. It's a neural net code you pick up from somebody else. And I have a student working with me who is in India right now, and he keeps getting NANs. He doesn't know why, because the code is not what he wrote. All right. So these are, this is the landscape we work with and we can sit and moan about it, but I think we are missing an opportunity. The way kids learn, I think is different. They don't learn the way we learned. I mean, we did things by rote. We did things by paper and pencil. We wrote code. That's no longer the way kids work. So understanding that and sort of modifying our teaching practices may be key. So rather than try to go back to the way things were, we have to, I think, adopt our teaching methods so that we are able to appeal to the kids today. And I don't know if I know how to do that, but that's certainly a direction we should be thinking about. Yeah. So uh, next is uh, Bina, you can uh, 
unmute yourself and you can ask your question hi uh, am i audible yeah yeah yes you are audible uh thanks to uh, Mr. Rao and uh, Anand for great talks. My question is uh, to Professor Rao. Uh, one is it just a simple clarification. You mentioned earlier on that non-equilibrium forces are new listed. Uh, the forces remain the same. Is it just implying that the system is in, the entire system is in non-equilibrium, I guess? Is that correct? There are no new kind of forces that we are talking about, isn't it? Uh, so, so you mean they are not uh, they are not new kind of forces in terms of their? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but then we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I am just getting a uh, intermittent signal. So, uh, yeah, there are indeed not new kinds of forces in the terms of uh, uh, electromagnetic forces or uh, you know stronger. We uh, ultimately all forces are related to those forces, but these just like uh, uh, but but these are forces that uh, these are forces that cannot be uh, so. Okay, so so there are a class of forces that, such as electrostatic forces, gravitational forces, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are derivable from an energy, okay, from an interaction energy. So those are the conventional forces that you you uh, talk about. There are other class of forces which are not derivable from an energy, and non-equilibrium active forces are examples of that. Okay, so there is no uh, energy or free energy uh, uh, from which you can derive these forces. These are typically forces that violate Newton's third law, for instance. Okay, because they are, you don't need to respect any of this, uh, the, these uh, principles when you're driving the system out of equilibrium at the scale of each particle. Yeah, so tail balance and all, they're not honored. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, so a lot of these, <clears throat> a lot of these forces break time reversal invariance at the microscopic level. And so they're not the conventional forces. So if we put this, uh, it, it's very naive on my part. Uh, so if you put this in the context of when um, a biological system is in a steady state, then what is driving the reaction to stay in this? Or are we just, I mean, there's so much of dynamics that every time we're looking, I mean, uh, the kinetics come into play and then the systems keeps changing and evolving. Is that how it works? Or uh, it's not clear to me is then what is driving right. these reactions? Uh, right. So, uh, so the food that we eat, I think. <laughs> The new, like we, yeah, the, 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 I can't hear you very well, but I, I, I'm just trying to uh, interpolate between the various few words that you can hear and then. <laughs> so, Madan, what she's asking, can you hear me? Yeah. Like, what are the drivers? Like, what, what is the driving? Like, how do they stay out, uh, exist without? Is it just dynamics or there is something else? Okay, so just uh, this thing. So uh, you could have a system which, <clears throat> for instance, uh, if you take a, a glass of water and look at the molecules in the water, in the in the uh, in the glass of water, then they are of course, as you know, uh, Anand said, they are colliding with each other and settling into some steady state. That steady state is an equilibrium steady state at a given temperature and pressure. Yeah, uh, and and and, uh, but even though it reaches a steady state. It does not mean that the molecules are not moving. There is a lot of dynamics that is happening, but this is dynamics in the steady state. Uh, you can ask for what is the distribution of velocities and that will be a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay, But now in the cell, uh, the cell is con being constantly churned up by this non-equilibrium activity at the scale of the molecules. So the resulting steady state that you get is a non-equilibrium steady state, not an equilibrium steady state. Okay. The distribution of velocities, and here also, 
molecules are moving around as they were moving around in, in equi the equilibrium steady state. But the distribution of velocities and uh, so on is very different from what it is in equilibrium. Okay. okay. And you Indeed, need, you know, you one of the interesting energy. features is that equilibrium. Yeah, one of the interesting features is that in equilibrium, the uh, you know the uh, equal the probability distribution of the velocities decouples from the position, okay. and it, it it reaches a Boltzmann distribution. Now, in uh, systems that are driven out of equilibrium, the probability distribution of velocities and particles and positions that don't decouple. Yeah. Okay, okay, so there's there are all kinds of interesting features in a non-equilibrium driven system. If you drive the system at the scale of the molecule itself, that is absolutely fundamentally different from the equilibrium counterpart. Okay, and this is the subject of much uh, theoretical and experimental work uh, done these days. And it goes under the name of active matter physics. Okay. And uh, cell living systems are, are uh, sort of the preeminent realization of this uh, of active matter. Okay, thank you. Something yeah. very new to me. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I think there are no more raised hands. So I think okay. and that uh, anyone else, if you want to interact. Uh, okay, I see there are no more raised hands. So I think we come to the conclusion of this session. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rao. Yeah. It has been an honor to host you on our platform. And Dr. Anand, uh, thank you so much for you. giving us your time. And to all the participants, please do follow us for our next series of talks. And we, we will be having many more such sessions in the coming time and other activities also. So please do watch out of our space on your Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and do visit our website also, www.biologicallyspeaking.com. And please write to us if you have any suggestions or, or anything you want to share us to want to improve or you want us to do. Uh, please do write to us and thank you so much for attending this session. And once again, thank you so much, Professor Rao and Dr. Anand. It Thanks. was great Bye. having you. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye, Madan. Bye, Sanat. Bye, Tripathi.